America's crazy. Like we'll say, oh, you know, uh, you should finish whatever you read. I'm like, well, that's stupid advice. I mean, think of think of reading a book like eating a piece of food. You 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 try a chapter, you're like, oh, oh my gosh, that's disgusting. Well, maybe it gets better. Oh, no, it's disgusting. I mean, if you find a book you don't like, put it down. There was over 4 million books written in English last year alone. Some of them are pretty good. Don't waste your time on the lame ones. Welcome to the Be It Till You See It podcast, where we talk about taking messy action, knowing that perfect is boring. I'm Leslie Logan, Pilates instructor and fitness business coach. I've trained thousands of people around the world. And the number one thing I see stopping people from achieving anything is self-doubt. My friends, action brings clarity, and it's the antidote to fear. Each week, my guests will bring bold, executable, intrinsic, and targeted steps that you can use to put yourself first and be it till you see it. It's a practice, not a perfect. Let's get started. All right, be it babe, welcome back to the Be It Till You See It podcast. So I have a great interview for you today. Um, first of all, do you know um, that the reason why I call Be Till You See It is it's like you're acting as if you are the person you want to be already. And a lot of times we wait till we have the thing to be the thing. So um, uh, you be the thing and then you'll actually do the things that that person, that your version of that person would have if they were already there. And then you'll have the thing. So be you have. Uh, be it till you see it. Um, anyways, that's my little lesson for you because what's about to happen is get a lot of amazing lessons. So my guest today is Danny Brissell. He, you're in here. He's doing four freaking phenomenal things. I don't know how he's doing all four of them, I'm, but he's doing them and it's really cool. Um, for my parents listening, there's some great things in here for your kiddos. For my non-parents, hi, I see you. I got so much out of this and I don't even have kids. So do not uh, skip to the next one. This is absolutely one you want to listen to. Um, and really, like, I hope you take any one of the action steps that he gives throughout. And then also the one at the end, we've never heard it before. And I bet you, you're going to use it starting today. Um, so please let us know if you do. Make sure you reach out to Danny, reach out to the Be It Pod and let us know what your favorite takeaways are. Here is Danny. All right, be it, babe. I am so excited to chat with our guest today, Danny Brassell. He is here to rock your world for sure. Um, I read his bio. Um, the Jim Carrey, huh? Of, uh, <laughs> I, I was like, oh my God, I have to talk to this man. So Danny, will you tell everyone who you are and what you rock at and maybe why they maybe assert Jim Carrey towards you? <laughs> With what you do. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you so much for having me, uh, Leslie. We need a lot more of you in the world. You're spreading joy, and I appreciate that. We need you. Uh, my mission is to bring joy back into education and the workplace, and I do that in four different ways. First of all, I speak about 100 dates a year all around the world, primarily to schools and parent groups, but also to corporations, reminding them, take your job seriously, but don't take yourself too seriously because you ain't all that, and neither am I. And if you think you're all that, teach kindergarten for a week. They'll set you straight. <laughs> uh, secondly, I've got the world's top reading engagement program uh, for parents, which in just over two months shows parents how to get their kids to read more, read better, and most importantly, to love reading. I mean, I find that schools do an adequate job of teaching kids how to read. But the question I always ask people is, what good is it teaching a kid how to read if they never want to read? I teach kids why to read because I've never had to tell a kid, go watch TV. I've never had to tell a kid, go play a video game. And I never want to have to tell a kid, go read. I want them to choose to do it on their own because they love it. Third, I uh, work uh, with entrepreneurs, small business owners, and executives on how to create engaging presentations that get their audience to take the next step, whether that's to purchase their product or to donate to their cause or even to invest in their ideas. And then fourth, I'm the uh, North American CEO of a company called Cyber Smarties, which was uh, founded in 2015 in Ireland by a guy named Dermot Udner, which is a social media platform for kids ages 5 to 12 that teaches kids how to use social media in a positive way. So the way it works is if you were to type in, Danny, I think you're fat and ugly, uh, it wouldn't let you send the message. Instead, it says, that's not a nice thing to say to Danny. And... Our studies show that within three days, it frustrates kids so much that they can't send their message that they stop sending negative messages altogether. And the program's basically completely eliminated cyberbullying in Ireland. Now it's in New Zealand, India, Turkey, 
Oh and I'm in charge of getting it here in North America. So uh, all of these are all mission oriented, though. You know, I think life is too short and we all have to smile a lot more. That's why I listen to your podcast. Oh, my God. OK, so many amazing things. I love I love that you shared all of that because I hope everyone heard like you can be multifaceted and they don't all have to have the same facets. <laughs> it's like I would never have guessed the fourth one at all. And I know that all of the parents listening are like, how do we, who do we need to call <laughs> in our Congress? <laughs> um, we'll put the Congress phone number in the show notes, guys. I've got it memorized because it's on a sweatshirt uh, that we have. But who do we need to call to get that in? Because my goodness, even as an adult, I've been bullied online. So like I can't even imagine what it's like for the kiddos. Um, my first thing I have to ask you is, you know, so many people would have so many great ideas and then they don't have to take that first next step. You do four incredibly humongous things that are mission driven and making massive in impact. How did you, I guess the first one would be the hardest one, but like, how did you make these steps? Because I'm sure people told you, Danny, you can't do all of those things. You can't speak a hundred mm -hmm. dates a year and, and fix bullying and get kids to read. Like, I feel, <laughs> I feel like that's a lot. So how are you able to make that happen with, with all the obstacles that are out there? Well, I have OCD. I have, I, I, I mean, and I, I ADHD and every other type of uh, acronym and abbreviation you want to give. Uh, really what I want everybody to know is that in order to do anything, you have to screw up a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I work with, uh, I was working with an entrepreneur the other day and we put together what we call his stump speech or how to introduce yourself to new uh, audiences. And he, I said, you got to practice. You got to go on tomorrow and deliver the speech. He's like, but it's going to stink. I'm like, exactly. And the day after that, I want you to give the speech and it's going to stink, but it's going to stink a little bit less than the first time you did it. And by the 20th time, you start feeling comfortable and you'll, you'll start to get the hang of it. But most of us, we fear things because we've never done them. And that's what all of this audience has to embrace is we got to get comfortable being uncomfortable. And uh, there's always going to be that. It's amazing how many people are experts about things they have no idea about. They they they've never traveled the world. And yet they're like, oh, you can't go there. It's dangerous. And they've never started a business. They say, oh, you can't do that. You'll, you're you're going to do bad. But everybody's an expert, but they haven't done anything. And so I gravitate towards people that are actually doing things. I'd much rather be around people that failed gloriously than the people that do the worksheets and fill in the uh, fill in between the lines. They just live a, a, a safe, dull life. That's not what life's about. Life is meant to to take risk. Mm. Oh, my gosh. It's like you've heard the intro to this podcast. We always say, <laughs> take messy action and do it scare. Like, it is interesting. You know, I feel like people are people been raised to get the A, right? Like you talked about schools and my mom's a teacher and she's listening. Hi, mom. You do great work. <laughs> My trainer is also a teacher for kindergartners. <laughs> that well, mm -hmm. that really does humble you. And so there's obviously they, there's amazing people in the educational world, but there's this there at some point you get to a point where it's like you have to get the A's because the grades only matter because then you don't get to the next step and like your whole life will be ruined if you don't get this. So then we become these perfectionists because that's the only thing that matters. And it's like we don't take that risk. I feel like little kids take more risks than adults do. <laughs> yeah. you're, you're absolutely right. That's why I love being around kids is, uh, you know, I, I'll ask adults, uh, what's two plus two and I get complete silence. I can ask little kids what's two plus two and they'll raise their hands and be like four, seven, I got a dog. And I love that, <laughs> you know, uh, they, they just play with things. And it's really, it takes them until about third grade where the kids, are just like that adult audience. They're completely mm -hmm. quiet. Uh, they stay in their seat because school taught them not to take risk. And it, it, it breaks my heart all the time. We need mm -hmm. to encourage people. You know, I read biographies of successful people, Leslie, all the time. And there's one common element most successful people in these biographies have. Most of them dropped out of school. And as an educator, that appalls me. I'm like, what are we doing wrong? How do we make sure to nurture those passions insides of those kids and you know uh i'm still growing and learning all the time and that's that's again people that listen to po I'm, I'm speaking to the wrong people right now these are the people that want to actually improve themselves mm -hmm. but that's what you do is you constantly challenge yourself to get better because every day you're not learning you're slowly dying yeah i agree and i think well first of all every single person listening to this you know they're seekers but that's because there's people around them that can't give that. Like we're almost being the friend in their ear because the friend in their 
actual ear is telling them, you can't do that. You couldn't do three different jobs. You have kids. You have the, how do you have all your stuff to do? And it's like, they need us in their ears to remind them that they're capable and it's going to be amazing. And it's going to suck the first 20 times. It's okay. (laughs) Go listen to this podcast. The first 20 episodes, guys, take a listen. I'm sure it was Mm -hmm. fine. (laughs) And I'm grateful for my amazing friends, but you get better over time where when this episode comes out, we'll have over 300 episodes out. So like you just get better. Yeah. Congratulations, Leslie. That's wonderful. Thank you. I I know it's kind of insane that how the fast that happens, but you just, you get better and you get, you're less nervous when you talk to a stranger. Like there's just so many things you just have to get started. Mm -hmm. Um, so yes, we are speaking, you maybe are speaking to the wrong audience, but I think maybe we're just reminding the, the people that they can do it. And they don't have to be perfect at it. Well, at least we're speaking to an audience of people that are going going to go out and do something, which is important. Yeah, yeah. No, it's so hard. I mean, like, um, I've talked about this on the on the pod before, but like, I talked about, I'd call my grandpa. And I'm like, hey, grandpa, how are you doing? He's like, well, I'm waiting to die. And it's like, awesome, cool. And then I go, well, I'm going to go to Cambodia. He's like, you should be really safe. Like, that's very dangerous there. And I'm like, so I've been seven times. We're doing great. Like. <laughs> Feels safer than here. Just going to say it. <laughs> yeah. So, well, and, and that's an important point you just made, Leslie. You need to surround yourself with positives. I mean, I was watching a show on television the other day. It was horrible. It was called uh, The News. And it totally depressed me. It showed all <laughs> these horrible things happening. And one of the things I learned from my life, my wife, I don't even know if she knows who the president of the United States is. She has no time for that. She watches I Love Lucy and Friends, and she's a much better person for it. I mean, I used to volunteer for the Special Olympics. If you ever feel down, you need to volunteer for the Special Olympics. Those individuals are some of the most extraordinary people. I just think that they have a secret that the rest of us don't realize, which is life is to be lived and to be celebrated every day. Yeah. Oh. Yes, I agree to that. I mean, please also volunteer at your local dog shelter and you'll mm-hmm. see that dogs don't judge you. They have no, <laughs> they don't care if you're perfect, all those things and it'll uplift that's your right. spirits. But that's really funny. Yeah, I know the the news is the news is designed to make us scared, to make us fearful and for us just to sit there for them to put another ad in front of their your face. You also just so you know, that's what they're, that's why they do the clicky headlines and they repeat themselves all the time. It's so hard because, um, there's FOMO. I need to, I don't want to miss out. I need to know this information. And it, and it's true. We do have to, you, there's got to be a balance there, which is so hard to do. Um, so I, I feel for the people who listen, who's like, but I have to listen to this, Danny, but also I would like to just watch friends and then, you know, do my thing and, and stick with my idea. Um, I want to, uh, go into something though. You talked about helping kids want to read mm-hmm. a lot of our listeners, not children. They want to read. <laughs> So Mm -hmm. even though they're not kiddos, um, can you, can we dive a little bit into like what will help because they want to read, but it's also like making the time, uh, what should they read? Like, again, they're perfectionists. So then there's a new obstacle of like, well, I want to read, but I don't know what to read. How do you have any advice for us on that? Absolutely. Well, I was that kid. I grew up hating reading. My father was a librarian. I always hated the library. It always it smelled funny to me. The furniture was uncomfortable. There was always some elderly woman telling me to be quiet. There was always a freaky homeless guy hanging out by the shelves, thought he was a vampire. I always hated the library. And it wasn't until I started teaching in the inner city in South Central Los Angeles, where I saw a lot of my students didn't have a lot of the advantages I had growing up. I mean, I was very blessed, Leslie. Both of my parents were in the home. Uh, we weren't wealthy by any means, but we always had food on the table. And my parents always read in front of us kids, to us kids, and we always had plenty of access to great reading materials. And uh, I basically said, shame on me. It's my job to really uh, uh, expose my students to all kinds of ways to to love reading. I mean, I was that kid. I'll, I'll never forget in high school. I was forced to read The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. And and no offense to people that love Nathaniel Hawthorne. I mean, I don't want to offend anybody, but basically the the story is about Hester Prynne commits adultery, so she's forced to wear an A on her chest. And I raised my hand in class one day, and I asked my teacher if I could wear a B on my chest because I was so bored reading that book. I absolutely (laughs) hated it. And I think that's one of the most important things we have to understand is, you know, it has to be fun, like make reading fun for you. And the research 
is very clear on this. It doesn't matter what you read. What matters is how much you read. It doesn't matter if you're reading James Joyce or James and the Giant Peach. People who read more read better. You know, uh, when I got my PhD, my wife was looking at me because I had this huge grin on my face. And she's like, why are you so happy? I'm like, because from now on, I pick the books. <laughs> and I think that's what reading should be. You know, if you want to read, you know, a lot of the people in your audience are entrepreneurs. Well, you don't have to read classic literature to be a good entrepreneur. You need to read about other entrepreneurs. What's their journey? You know, uh, I, I get so many boys interested in reading because I find out what they're interested in. I mean, I, I eavesdrop. If the kids are talking about NASCAR, get them some NASCAR books. If they're talking about J-Lo, get a biography on Jennifer Lopez. You know, interest drives reading, and that's something that's going to be sustained all the time. I mean, I I see things all the time. It's it's America's crazy. Like, we'll say, oh, you know, uh, you should finish whatever you read. I'm like, well, that's stupid advice. I mean, think of think of reading a book like eating a piece of food. You 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 try a chapter, oh, oh my gosh, that's disgusting. Well, maybe it gets better. Oh no, it's disgusting. I mean, if you find a book you don't like, put it down. There was over four million books written in English last year alone. Some of them are pretty good. Don't waste your time on the lame ones. Here, I'll do something for your audience right now, Leslie. For all those people who have that large book on your bedside table that you started three years ago, I can do this because I'm a PhD. I absolve you of that book. <laughs> Get another one. You know, I like reading. I have one of the top reading clubs online. It's called LazyReaders.com. If you go, it's a free subscription. Once a month for the rest of your life, I update it with 10 book recommendations, three or four adult level, three or four young adult level, and three or four children's level books, all under 250 pages. So you have something you can read when you're stuck at a boring meeting or at the doctor's office. You know, may, if, when I hear people say, oh, I don't, have, I don't have time to read, I'm like, yeah, what is time to read after you watch the game on TV, have a couple of beers, go out shopping? I have a friend that's a time management expert. I always give him a hard time, Leslie, because I say there's no such thing as time management. There's only priority management. Yeah. Harvard did a study. Whenever I cite research, I always say Harvard did a study. <laughs> Harvard did a study. A hundred years ago, they found out that people only had 24 hours in their day as well. It's how are you using those minutes in your day? So uh, the, the people that have a hard time uh, getting interested, you know, I'll work with parents that are trying to figure out how to get their kids in, into reading. So there's two numbers I in my reading program. There's two numbers I have everybody focus on. The, the first number is 67. So a lot of people say it takes 21 days to change a habit. And to those people, I say, show me the research on that. It's a completely fabricated number. I know 100%. exactly where it comes, where it comes from. What's I that? To, I, it's 100 um, percent fake. It doesn't work. Um, and we can talk about it, but I study with BJ Fogg from Stanford. So, you know, the West coast, um, and you can actually create a habit in a moment. Like you can, it's all about on emotion. Your emotion derives things, but that's, you a can do a lot. Yeah. Well, so when they did a clinical study, so the, the number comes from, there was a great book written in 1960 by Dr. Maxwell Maltz called psycho cybernetics. I encourage everybody to read the book, but in the, in the, in the preface of the book, Dr. Maltz was a plastic surgeon, and he flippantly said he noticed it took most of his patients about 21 days to get used to their new faces. Well, a lot of personal development gurus, a lot of people I respect, by the way, started telling people it takes 21 days to change a habit. It's completely fabricated. So um, <laughs> it sounds really there good. Was a study done by uh, Harvard did a study in 2009. It was actually University of London. It was a hab habit formation study, and they determined. It took anywhere from 18 to 254 days to change a habit, and the average was 66 days. Well, I don't like the number 66, so I threw in a bonus day. 67 days to change a habit, and it really depends on uh, the type of habit you're trying to form. So it can be a moment. Um, like if you want to drink a glass of water before breakfast every day, that might take 18 days to make that into a habit. But if you want to quit smoking... That can yeah. take 254 days. And here's why this is important, Leslie. Let's say you go on a diet. You follow it religiously for 21 days. But on day 22, you, you fall off the wagon. Well, you blame yourself. Well, research shows it takes three times longer than that to form most habits. Yeah. And so I, I just think it's very... I, I have a problem when I hear people throwing out these numbers and everybody, it, everybody's a little bit different. Yeah. I, I was a teacher. I always say different strokes for different folks. Some kids get it in 10 minutes. Some kids, it takes until April, but where there's a will, there's a way. Yeah. The other number I want people to, and this would be good for your audience to know is 
is the number is 20. So researchers were looking at patterns among successful students around the world. They were looking for what are the characteristics, what are the common characteristics they have? And they, they stumbled upon something that which, which floored them. It was the number of minutes spent reading outside of school. So they looked at the low kids, the average kids, and the high kids. So the first group was the low kids, the kids in the 20th percentile, some of your F students. Uh, they averaged less than a minute a day reading outside of school. Well, that didn't surprise anybody. It's probably why you're at the bottom of your class. But the next number did startle the researchers. The kids in the middle of the class, the 70th percentile, C students, they average 9.6 minutes a day reading outside of school. And so if I'm doing a live training with parents, this is when the room gets really quiet and the first hand raises and a parent says, well, wait a sec, are you saying if I can get my kid to read 10 minutes a day, I can take him from an F to a C? That's exactly what I'm saying. There's actually a lot of research to support this. But this next number really floored the researchers. The kids near the top of the class, 90th percentile, A minus students, do they spend three hours a day reading for fun outside of school? No. Do they spend an hour a day outside of school reading for fun? No. The average was just over 20 minutes a day. So my entire program is showing parents how can we find those 20 minutes every single day. And there's two things people have to understand. First of all, uh, the number, the, the minutes don't have to be consecutive. So you can do a minute here, five minutes here, three minutes there. And secondly, being read aloud to is just as good as reading on your own. So I work with a lot of dyslexic students. A lot of people don't realize over half of the Fortune 500 CEOs are dyslexic. Yes. Well, dyslexics, they process information really well with their ears. And so now I just say, well, turn on the audio book. Let somebody else read it to you. You don't have to read it. It's just as effective. I'm so excited. Um, because at one of them, first of all, I'm like, oh, so I, if I read 20 minutes a day, the overachiever in me is like, I'm going to be an A student. I'm not even in school, but I feel like it's just going to make me a better person. But no. also, I hope you all heard that he said audio book works as well. And so like, you guys, if you are got a 20 minute commute, <laughs> instead of listening to your news podcast, you can listen to ours, but you then should listen to a book for 20 minutes. That's such a great thing. I love that. Also, um, uh, there's, so there's this interesting thing. One, if you love to read, read BJ Fox, tiny habits book, you will love it Two, Um, it's all, also emotions. So if you are try, like, for, first of all, we can all remember back during the pandemic when we wore a mask everywhere, every single day, then they took us out of mask for like a week. And they're like, Oh, hold on. Actually, you still have to wear the mask at the grocery store. How many times do you have to go back to the grocery store every day, every day? Because... <laughs> You didn't like wearing the mask, so you never created the habit. So yeah. if you don't like the thing, it's not going to stick because the emotions around it are not exciting. Um, so that's why the repetition doesn't work, because it has to have an emotional pull that you actually like to do. And then second on the like breaking a habit or unra I, I, a BJ will say unraveling a habit, because habits are prompted by different things. If you are a smoker, there's a prompt that happens. If you eat, a sna if you eat candy at your desk, there's a prompt. You have to remove the prompt to figure out what that is. And you can't have nothing there because it creates a vacuum. So you actually do have to find. So that one, those do take harder. Or if you're if your habit is to like emote, like beat yourself up, like if you're someone who just like judges yourself, has bad thoughts when someone says anything critical type of a thing, those habits are actually the hardest to break because you have to be really good at acknowledging like, oh, I'm doing this thing that I don't want to do. <laughs> So that's why the, that's why the make numbers sure, can get really make good. Make sure you have them listen to this podcast. They'll be so proud of you. You're a great student. You learned a lot. You know. I know. BJ will, will love it. Uh. <laughs> well, and the other thing is habit stacking. So for example, like uh, I was watching too much TV and I wasn't working out enough. And so now when I go on the bike, I, you know, I'm watching, I'm almost done. I'd never watched The Sopranos when it came out. So now I'm on season six, I'm halfway through but I only watch Sopranos when I'm on the bike. After I finish The Sopranos, I'll go to my next show. So it, it's yes. every, what you were talking about with the grocery store. Yes. Uh, it's amazing how primitive our brains really are. They really are, but it's that dopamine hit. And also like, because you want to watch that show and you have really good mm -hmm. boundaries and willpower. <laughs> I don't mm -hmm. know. Um, it's really, so, but it's so, I, I just want to say, I thank you for going over the reading thing. One, every parent in here is so excited. They just learned something about their kids. Um, so I'm happy to give them that. But two, you know, we've gotten questions from the audience before about like just wanting to have time to read. It's like, you don't act, you just like put the book in your bag 
or put like have the audiobook on your phone. And then instead of when you're in line at Starbucks going on Facebook, you could hit play for a couple of minutes. So my husband may, may I share another strategy yes. with you, Leslie? Yes. This is for everybody in your audience. I'm not too sharp and I, I like to look like I'm sharp to people. And so before I go to parties, I'll go to either the the bookstore or to the library and to the children's section and I'll read like 10 32 page picture biographies of famous people so that, you know, I can, oh, Elon Musk, did you know this about him? Well, I got it from a picture book, but you know, everybody's like, wow, he knows all these amazing things. <laughs> I don't know why it is as we get older, they take the pictures out of the books. I'm like, oh, I like picture books. They're a lot easier to read. And you don't have to be judged by it. I, mean, I used to tutor uh, athletes that were, they had earned scholarships to universities, but they were, you know, academically ineligible. So I had one gentleman. And uh, he had a full ride scholarship. He was going to be a defensive lineman. He was six foot nine inches tall, 325 pounds. He had a full ride, but he was the 12th grader reading at a first grade level. Mm. And so they gave him to me and they're like, Danny, can you get him up to a sixth grade in six months? And I said, okay, I'll do it. And so um, I had to get him reading, but he want, he. He wants to read this, but he's reading at a first grade level. Well, first grade level books are about like bunny rabbits and puppy dogs. Well, 12th graders don't want to read books about bunny rabbits and puppy yeah. dogs, but that was his reading uh, ability at that point. And so what I said is, uh, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to write a book for a first grade class. Um, but before we write the book, we got to figure out what do first graders like to read? Do you know? He's like, no. And I'm like, okay, so here, we'll go, we'll start reading all these. You see what I just did? Mm -hmm. Now he has permission. So when his buddies see him reading first grade level books, now he has permission because, of, oh, because I'm writing a book for a first grade class, you know, and we were able to get him up to uh, a sixth grade level in six months. But it's just figuring out, it's, this is what every, every good teacher of anything does. They figure out where you are and then they take you to the next level. Mm -hmm. You know, the problem in most education systems is, we think every kid's at the same level. And, and I'm like, no, I mean, kids are entering at different levels. They have mm -hmm. different interests. Uh, you know, having taught young children, I have no idea how men even evolve because you give me a six-year-old boy and a six-year-old girl and almost to the T, I can tell you that girl's about three, three levels above that little boy. I mean, boys are nincompoops. Uh, <laughs> uh, they finally catch up eventually, at least most of them do. Some of them, I, mean, I shouldn't say most, some of them do. Uh, but it's it's fascinating. I, I, I just love looking at, well, what turns this kid on to learning? And, you know, same thing with adults too. I'm When I'm working with adults, I'm like, wow, this is what proves effective with this person. I, to me, that's the fun part. Yeah, I know. My mom has a really good time like coming up with different ways to teach different learning styles, but it makes you go, how come we aren't just letting the girls go in at kindergarten at this age? And why don't we just let the boys come in a year later? Like, well, that the problem. Like, I know, guys, we don't have childcare in this country. Sorry, we'll get it. <laughs> figure it out. Yeah. We'll figure that out. And then we can figure out because it is really funny that we almost hold one age group back and then we expect another a another person to like rise up. It's a, it's not fair to anyone. No one is actually having a good time. And then the teachers are exhausted. <laughs> yeah. So and then the parents, sorry, and, and then the parents are exhausted. So um Okay, I have one more topic I wanted to bring up with you because you have so many facets. You mentioned that one of the things you do is help people, like help people take an action, like, right? Okay, so we do have a lot of entrepreneurs here who are hoping that people take an action. Also, there's a lot of people here who are hoping that they'll just take an action. <laughs> so, so do you have anything for us? Like, I'm sure it is a long journey to figuring that out, but like, what is like a hot, like simple tip to taking action? Or to get well, people to take I'll an give action. you all an action that I, I use. Uh, I'll, I'll do two day seminars with uh, entrepreneurs when we're creating uh, a speech and I have a formula for it. And I'm like, once you learn the formula, you can use it for anything. But here, here's a, an action strategy for everybody that I tell them to do is uh, tonight, get a libation of choice, a pen and paper. And I want you to write down every story that's ever happened in your life. And I don't mean the whole story. I just mean triggers. So like... Uh, the time I locked myself out of the car in front of Costco. The time dad spilled mustard on his tie in that fancy restaurant. And in an hour, you'll probably come up with about three to 400 stories like that. So that's the first part of the exercise. The second part is now you have to associate, well, what's the teaching point here? So you're like, oh, well, this is really a story about loyalty. Oh, this is a story about taking responsibility. Oh, this is a leadership story. And then what you do 
is put them in folders on your computer. So the next time you have, you're asked to speak anywhere and you need like, oh, a story on love. Well, here's 20 stories on love I have right here at my disposal. It's just a really easy. And then, you know, I'll work with some people. They say, well, Danny, nothing's ever happened to me. I'm like, well, whatever. Everybody said a million stories. But even for that Debbie Downer that has to be negative and say nothing's ever happened to them, here's the next tip. I get, I, no, I, I, I broke my rule. I don't give tips. I, I give tips to waiters, not to people. Uh, let me give you a strategy. Yes, so, I love. Okay. Um, so so the, the strategy is if you look at personal development books, one of the most successful personal development books of all time is Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, in which he includes no personal stories. Every story he includes is based on interviews he did with the millionaires that he interviewed. I mean, you could definitely, just based on the 300 guests you've had on your podcast, you could easily create a whole big uh, compendium of all these different stories you've gotten and all the different teaching points. And so if, if you have, if you find you're, you're completely boring, well, then you have to be a student of the world. And I mean, this is why I'm watching things all the time that help me. I'm like, oh, um, I've, I'm addicted to a show on History Channel called The Food That Built America, where they tell you, they show you how different foods came about. I'm like, oh, this is amazing. And so I have stories about that. Uh, I watch sports all the time. And my wife's like, why do you love sports? And I'm like, because at any given moment, something extraordinary can happen. And they happen all the time mm -hmm. where you see like that one act of sportsmanship. You're like, wow, that's a really neat story. Or, or you see somebody that's hurt and they play a hurt. Like, wow, that's endurance. Uh, and so that's why, again, it's and it's the same thing by listening to this podcast is, oh, I'm learning. I'm learning all the time. I'm hearing, you know, you, you, BJ gave you all these great. I'm like, wow, you learned a lot. And he gave you some stories. But people, they don't remember, you know, it was, it was actually Stalin who said a million dead is a statistic. One dead is a tragedy. And he's right about that is the way you connect with people is through stories. I think one of the. I think it was President Reagan was the very first president of the United States that during his State of the Union address before Congress, instead of talking about health care, which nobody understood, he'd say, uh, hey, Joe, 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 Joe Thompson, get up, stand up. And all of a sudden, this guy in the gallery waves, that's Joe Thompson. He's like, Joe works at the GM plant in Louisville, Kentucky, and Joe got injured on the job a couple of months ago, but he didn't have health insurance. And it's cost him. He can't make his rent. He can't. And so now when we think healthcare, we think Joe, we've put a face to the problem. Mm -hmm. And now we're starting to understand it a lot better. This is, you know, mean to my, uh, my biblical people out there. Jesus was like the greatest salesman ever. That's what he always <laughs> did. He always, J Jesus didn't say, you know, four out of five of my apostles have to do this. No, he, he would always give you absolute actual stories. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how we remember things is from stories. And yeah. so, uh, again, long answer to your short question, but those are a couple of action items for your audience to take right now. I love that because um, it's so true. I write, I have to write, you know, at least two newsletters per week. And then I have all the social media content that goes out. And I don't care what people say about no one reads the captions. People read my captions on how I know because I put an action step in there at the very end and they have to comment. And it's always different. It's like drop your favorite color. Dude, what's your favorite number? Whatever. And people do it all the time. I go, I take up all 2,200 characters on Instagram, you guys. They do, but I, I need stories because no one wants to just hear, like the facts are great. Like the facts about why you should move, why you should work out, the facts about habits. It's all fine. But if you don't tell a story, no one's really interested. And then when they, when they read the story and they take an action because they, I feel like they attach, they, that story can relate to them in some way. Or that, you know, that's what you're saying. So anyways, I love that. Thank you for that one. Okay. You're amazing. You do so many things on this planet. <laughs> I feel like we'll have to have you back. I can't wait for Brad to listen to this because he is just really going to love because he's in a, I'm just going to share this with, with y'all. He does this gentleman's hang once a quarter and all the guys like read actual, like the biggest thick books. One of our friends has an entire library. He's like reading so many books all the time and they all bring a book to talk about. And Brad, it's like their book is like, okay, we're going to bring a book about America. We're going to bring a book of whatever the theme is. And Brad's like, so I'm listening to this. Like, I don't know you guys, he's talked about so many times. Oops. Anyways, it's something about time and it's about a guy. The author died a long time ago and some other people are writing the books. There's like 15 in the series and he's starting them all over and he listens to them. 
And he loves to listen to a book because he can listen to it while he's walking the dog. He can listen to it in bed, bef- like right before he goes to bed. And so I just really think he's going to love that you said we can listen to the books. He's going to have to read them. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so thank you. Okay. We're going to take a brief break. I'll find out what people can find you, follow you, work with you, hear more of your stories. All right, Danny, where do you hang out? Where can people stalk you in, in a good way? <laughs> well, as a, as a thank you for you and your audience bearing with me, uh, I wanted to give everybody a couple of freebies. So if you go to freegiftfromdanny.com, again, freegiftfromdanny.com, I'm going to give everybody a complimentary e-copy of my book, Read, Lead, and Succeed. This is a book I wrote for a school principal who was trying to keep his faculty and staff positively engaged. So I said, okay, I'll write you a book. So every week I give you a concept, I give you an inspirational quote, an inspirational story, a book recommendation on a book you should read, but you're probably too lazy because you're an adult. So I also give you a children's picture book recommendation that demonstrates the same concept. You can read that in five minutes. I'm also going to give everybody access to a five-day reading challenge I did online last summer for about 700 parents around the world where uh, every day for an hour for five consecutive days, I give you basic basic strategies. These are the it's based, the basis of my uh, reading program online, where I show you how to get your kids to read more, read better, and most importantly, to love reading. Uh, again, you get those at freegiftfromdanny.com. And I just really want to thank you, Leslie, for having me today. Uh, you're making a positive difference. Uh, every day, everybody has a choice. Uh, you know, uh, what was, what was, it was either Socrates or uh, Red in the Shawshank Redemption, who says uh, you can get busy living or you can get busy dying. So everybody out there, get busy living and and celebrate. Thank Mm -hmm. you, Leslie, for all that you do. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much. Hilarious that you quoted Shawshank Redemption. My girlfriend and I in college had one DVD for about three months, and it was the Shawshank Redemption. We watched it every day. (laughs) Because we have TV. It's like, what are you going to (laughs) do? Anyways, um. Before I let you go, you've given us so many amazing strategies. We like to end the episode with a be it action item. So bold, executable, intrinsic, or targeted steps people can take to be it till they see it. What do you have for us today? Well, you know, I was telling you to get those 20 minutes a day reading every single day, whether you're a kid or an adult. And people uh, that uh, they'll often tell me, well, I have nothing to read at home. I'm like, oh, but you do. Uh, President Bush Sr. over 30 years ago signed a very important law in this country. It says every single television set sold in America has to have closed captioning. So here's the quick strategy. Turn on the closed captioning. People say, well, wait a sec. If the show's in English and the subtitles are in English, what good does that do? I'm like, well, that's a fair point, but let me make this point. Have you ever watched a show with subtitles and not looked at the subtitles? It's very difficult to do. Your brain is directed towards the text. There's actual research that supports this. If you look at reading scores around the world, the more kids watch TV, the lower their reading scores are in every single country on the planet, except for one. The country with the highest reading scores on the planet also watches the most TV on the planet. It's Finland. And people always say, well, how can that be? I'm like, well, because Finland makes really bad TV shows. And so what they have to do is they import all these old American sitcoms like Happy Days and Gilligan's Island and Brady Bunch. And they subtitle them in Finnish, the kids are constantly reading. So this isn't just for kids. This is for adults as well. But, you know, turn on the subtitles. You'll be amazed at how it will help progress and advance your reading. Oh, my gosh. Blown away. Never have had that as an action item. Love it. Also had to do it on a flight recently because I could not hear the show. So I put the subtitles on and I was like, I am not even watching the show. I'm just reading the subtitles. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Ah, well, then, uh, you know, I did two hours of reading that day. Wonderful. Danny, thank you so much. This has been so wonderful. Just a joy. I love what you're doing on this planet. You're making amazing things. You'll have to let us know when we can get this this social media thing for kids to the U.S. um, and also what other countries, my listeners are in those ones. If you have kids and you're there, guess what? There's something for you. So y'all take a look at the links below. Make sure you check out Danny's freebies. They're all in the show notes. And until next time, be it till you see it. That's all I got for this episode of the Be It Till You See It podcast. One thing that would help both myself and future listeners is for you to rate the show and leave a review and follow or subscribe for free wherever you listen to your podcast. Also, make sure to introduce yourself over at the Be It pod on Instagram. I would love to know more about you. Share this episode with whoever you think needs to hear it. Help us and others be it till you see it. Have an awesome day. 
Be It Till You See It is a production of the Bloom Podcast Network. If you want to leave us a message or a question that we might read on another episode, you can text us at plus one three one zero nine zero five 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 three four or send a DM on Instagram at Be It Pod. It's written, filmed, and recorded by your hosts, Leslie Logan, and me, Brad Crowell. It is transcribed, produced, and edited by the epic team at Desenio.co. Our theme music is by Ali at Apex Production Music, and our branding by designer and artist Gianfranco Chofi. Special thanks to Melissa Solomon for creating our visuals. Also to Angelina Herico for adding all of our content to our website. And finally, to Meredith Root for keeping us all on point and on time.